Okay, in this video we're going to be taking a look at one specific type of fighting knife slash machete, uh, US issue LC14B, also known as the Woodsman's Pal. Before I go into that, I'm just going to have a quick talk about some of the other sort of iconic fighting knives uh, available to US forces during the Second World War. Now the first thing we need to, to note, this is a little short vignette video, is that the Americans produced the most astonishing variety of fighting knives and bayonets of any of the belligerents. I think probably they produce more knives than everybody else put together. There were some bloody good reasons for this. The Americans' experience in the Pacific, this is the United States Army units and specifically, really specifically the US Marine Corps, had an experience of combat which was very, very unusual in any other theatre and that was hand-to-hand -hand fighting with knives was something that was commonplace in the Pacific, particularly in the Central Pacific during the island hopping campaigns. The British, although there were many recorded instances, do not seem to have been the victim of the, the Japanese infiltration, the night infiltration tactics as were the American troops in the Central Pacific. The Americans and Australians fighting down in Papua New Guinea and a British 14th Army fighting in Burma, and again there are instances, recorded instances, it wasn't um, completely out of the question, but it just did not happen with the frequency that it did in the Central Pacific. We might speculate that the reason for this is that the Japanese could not retire. They could in Burma and to a lesser extent in Papua New Guinea if they were on a hiding to nothing and they had the option to conduct a fighting withdrawal, get out and live to fight another day, they would take it. In the Pacific, on the little islands, that they were, they were trapped. There was no possibility of evacuation, so they fought and died in situ and the fighting has a, a viciousness and a kind of desperation to it that uh, we don't encounter really anywhere else in any of the theatres of the Second World War. So the Americans had pretty bloody good reasons to be carrying knives in addition to their, their, their normal issue weapon and bayonet. The British, totally different sort of attitude, British and British Commonwealth. I'll just show you what they were given. They were given this piss weak little thing, it's a jackknife, it's basically a a pocket knife with a very ineffectual blade and a, a spike here for making holes and getting stones out of horses' hooves. It was kind of a hangover from the First World War. The British seem to have eschewed the use of fighting knives. We'll make the exception here for the Fairburn Sykes commando knife, but as a general rule, the soldiers relied on their bayonets, if they had to, or their entrenching tools. And there was almost a cultural reluctance to allow soldiers to festoon themselves with all manner of fighting knives and disemboweling cutlasses, etc. So the different kind of philosophy, but then again, the Americans had profoundly good reasons for utilizing and manufacturing these kinds of, of weapons. What I've got here is just a, a selection, a small selection of the fighting knives that I have. I have a couple more coming, uh, but it's just again, just for the purpose of illustration to contrast this uh, Woodsman's Pal, the type of things that the Yanks were using. A few of them very iconic. This one here, the old uh, combination knuckle duster, duster and triangular spike, the hangover from the First World War, uh, and alongside that, its its companion, which is the uh, the US 1918 LF and C, uh, manufactured by both the Americans and the French, reissued to airborne forces. Um, you see them in the Pacific also, not particularly uncommon. The US Marine Corps issued a series of bolos to their corpsmen. Uh, obviously they found you know, utility as fighting knives as well, and general purpose implements, but it was formally issued to the corpsmen for the purpose of cutting down small trees to make stretches. Alongside that we've got another iconic kind of fighting knife, the M3 trench knife derived from the carbine bayonet. There's a number of different variants of this. And this is something that you see commonly with US Airborne Forces, kind of strapped to their leg. Uh, used, used extensively in all theatres, but really more associated with US Airborne, uh, perhaps, than the others. We've got the K-Bar, the famous, in my estimation, the best fighting knife of the lot, the American K-Bar, associated really closely with the US Marines. And just for illustrative purposes, this Powell or Randall, um, a lot of these were issued, they were also available as commercial private purchases, and there are hundreds of different varieties which are legitimate collectibles. The whole fighting knife collectible area uh, is a specialist area in its own right. The references, there are multitudes, but this guy here, Michael W. Sylvie, is probably the source for the US 
uh, information. This particular book published really is an adjunct to the other books that he's, he's written and it's, it's really just a photographic record. Uh, and it's, it's very, very, very beautifully done. So you need a, 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 you know, an expert, this is the guy to, to go to. Just to contrast again, this is a knife that was manufactured here in New Zealand. Um, some of them were made in Australia. We didn't have a particularly sophisticated industrial base. So this is a kind of backyard, bloody forged thing that was made and sold to US troops garrisoning New Zealand in the aftermath of the Guadalcanal campaign before they shoved off and uh, went into their assault on Tarawa. Private purchase, usually some of them were issued. It is a grotesquely, hideously bad piece of kit. Aluminum hilt with a very rudimentary um, checkering and sort of a, a semi-prominent uh, uh, skull crusher. The blade itself was often made from the leaf spring of Ford trucks. They just took the old leaf springs, cut them down, sharpened them up, and there you have it. Huge variety of these things around. Some of them have uh, uh, knuckle protectors and knuckle dusters built into them. Big, chunky, ugly, bloody things. But you see them a lot, particularly in the early part of the Central Pacific campaign before the American logistics system started producing knives that could be, could be issued. And this has become collectible in its own right. Fifteen years ago, you couldn't give these things away. It would cost you about 30 bucks. Now they're up to several hundred dollars. Anyway, the one that we're looking at, uh, draw your attention to, is this one here. The Woodsman's Pal, the LC-14B. It's a combination fighting knife and machete. Similar principle to our Corman's Bolo. Uh, general purpose tool, but it was also intended as a kind of a cutlass. Big, big, heavy, bloody thing. That, that bit at the end is the hook, which is used to... Uh, pull towards you and cutting off saplings at, at uh, ground level. Pretty ugly, but pretty dramatic. Now the Americans are exceptional in, in, in um, producing and issuing purpose-built pouches and carrying kit for whatever they produced. And this, they're no exception here. What was interesting about this, I wasn't expecting it, was inside there are three little booklets. Again, this is, illustrates the American thoroughness. The dedication to producing the very best possible equipment for their troops and then providing them with all the information needed to maintain and utilize it. There are three different books. One deals with care and attention of the knife, how to use the thing, how to sharpen it. The second is a kind of a little backup which gives information about living in the jungle. Shows you there hacking into a coconut. As you've got to remember, most of the American soldiers were urbanites. They were not uh, certainly not familiar with, uh, with operating in jungle or tropical, tropical conditions. What's really interesting about this though is the third one. It is a instruction manual on how to fight with this knife. And again, it's oriented towards the Japanese. Within the, uh, the booklet itself, it talks about how to um, utilize it as a combat implement and specifically how to take on, for example, a Japanese soldier or officer wielding a saber. Shows you how to go about it. In addition to that, uh, it, it also deals with fighting somebody, again, Japanese, with a, a bayoneted rifle, how to overcome that adversary. So, I mean, just the thoroughness, the thought, the care and attention to detail, and the effort that was that went into doing this to make it, you know, the best possible bit of kit that they could, that they could issue is just mind-boggling. And it's really characteristic of all the American kit. I'm a real fan of this stuff, and I can see why the Commonwealth soldiers we're both envious and resentful because our wonderful governments gave us bits of crap like this. Anyway, that's just a quick vid. I uh, hope you're all well. Uh, I'll show you the new ones when they arrive. Talk to you soon.